bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. My title for today is Death to Doeg, Preserving Carriers of Revelation. Now, how many people know who Doeg is in the Bible? Raise your hand. <laughs> the man of God, yeah. <laughs> we got another one back there. Bless the name of the Lord. We're about to jump into this and open this up, but it's important. How many people were here the last time I, I came to minister? Bless the Lord. Amen. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take that as that you received. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. But yeah, we, we talked about mastering your motives last time I was here. And it was the grace to build in the might of God. And the Lord is keeping me in this vein because as, as the word of the Lord has been released over this house, of course, you guys are in the beginnings of a building phase. You are going not just concerning a building, but the, the grace of what God is doing. He's establishing a sure foundation. And because he's establishing a sure foundation, we have to make sure that that foundation is protected and that it is, is, is undergirded, that there is security. How many people have been to a construction site? Oftentimes, when the foundation is being poured, you cannot get into that area. We live in New York now, so I see construction everywhere. They knock down a house and they put an apartment there. And they put a whole setup where they fence it off and you can't get past it. You can't get in there at all. Why? Because if the foundation gets compromised, it ruins everything else that's built on top of it. And the enemy, we know, is super strategic in how he functions and operates to the point that the Bible tells us that uh, when the, in the parable of the wheat and the tares, that there was this framework that was there that a man did solid work, went out, plowed the field, planted good seed. But guess what? He and the watchman went to sleep. And as the watchman slept, the enemy crept in and put tares among the weeds. I mean, among the wheat, and it caused there to grow at the same time that which was unprofitable and what was profitable. The enemy loves to do that in houses. Why? Because the work becomes double in order to try to get to where you need to go, and it pulls you into a place of stagnation, and there's always fallout. Everybody in here has been a part of a church where somebody has walked away. Amen. Didn't finish their assignment. My time is up. Amen. I'm out. Everybody in here has experienced that. Amen. But the Lord wants us to be very keen in how we are establishing what he's doing here because he wants to make sure that not only is the foundation built, but that pillars are in place. Hallelujah. And if you know you're a pillar in here, you need to say amen a little stronger to that because you are agreeing. You're saying, Lord, let it be so concerning me. Yes, you are load-bearing. You are people that actually help to build, keep the building standing in its proper context. And you have what? The grace for longevity. You have the grace even for some things almost to be eternal in that sense. That it lasts generation to generation to generation as you build it properly. So... We're dealing with this concept of addressing Doeg, and I'm going to read you a few scriptures. We're going to be in, in the word for a little bit on the beginning, on the front end, but then we're going to dive headlong into the preach of the message. But 1 Samuel chapter 21, we're going to begin at verse 7 through 9, and then I'm going to jump down into 1 Samuel 22. But I'll read the first stanza, and, and we'll keep going. Now, a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day detained before the Lord. I want you to hold fast to that thought. He was detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg an Edomite, the chief of the herdsmen who belonged to Saul. So he had position. He had levels of influence and notoriety. And David said to Ahimelech, is there not here on hand a spear or a sword for I have brought neither my sword nor a weapon with me because the king's business required haste. Verse 9, so the priest said, the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. Don't miss that point. If you will take that, take it. For there is no other except that one here. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. I want you to understand this about this little framework. 
Doeg was detained by the Lord in a posture of observation. He was sent there, but had to stand there. But the question was, what did he see and how did he see it? How did he perceive what was standing, what was happening before him? And so there was an, an opportunity to witness the revelation of something that was being administered. Because it just was not by chance that the sword of Goliath, of David's greatest victory to date, was sitting there wrapped in a cloth, but behind the authority that was on the high priest. It had prophetic significance, even for where David was, and we're going to jump into that in just a second. But we got to find out what was in the heart of Doeg so that we know why we're saying death to Doeg. All right? 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 6 through 9. When Saul heard that David and his men were with him and had been discovered, now Saul was staying in Gibeah under a tamarisk tree in Ramah with his spear in his hand and all his servants standing about him. Then Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Here now, you Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? He's trying to bribe them. And make <clears throat> you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds. <clears throat> all of you have, uh, you have conspired against me, and there is no one who reveals to me that my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse, and there is not one who is uh, sorry for me, pity party, or reveals to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is this day. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, here he is speaking, who was set over the servants of Saul, and he said, I saw the son of Jesse going to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Verse 16, I'm going to skip down to that. And the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. Now, Ahimelech is the high priest. Then the king said to the guards who stood about him, turn and kill the priest of the Lord. Because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not tell it to me. But the servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike the priests of the Lord. And the king said to Doeg, you, turn and kill the priests. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck the priest and killed on that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. Also, Nob, the city of the priest, the whole city was a, a, a city that was built for the priest by the priest. He struck with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and nursing infants, oxen and donkeys and sheep with the edge of the sword. No one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, uh, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David and Saul that uh, told David that Saul had killed the, the Lord's priest. So David said to Abiathar, I knew that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have caused the deaths of all of these persons of your father's house. Stay with me. Do not fear. For he who seeks my life seeks yours. But with me, you shall be safe. Father, we thank you for what you're opening up and you're releasing into this house. Understand, Doeg is a, is a person that is reflective of a system. It's a demonic system. Here it was that when Saul uttered what he did, he uttered it to his servants who were committed to him that were all military men. Doeg was a herdsman. Wasn't said, it didn't say that he was in the army. He was a herdsman, meaning that he kept sheep. He had no business picking up a sword unless it was to kill a wolf, a lion, or a bear. He had no business getting in the king's business, but yet he presented himself available with an opportunity. Why? Because he had ambition. And because his ambition was off, the opportunity for him to walk into the point where his ambition was, he wanted to be elevated. 
The whole thought process behind where he was was that he thought maybe my space is just a little too small. These men don't want to do what the king is saying, so I'm going to have a lethal loyalty to this king more than I have a commitment and covenant to the living God. Because from my childhood, I've been taught the Torah. From my childhood, I've been taught the instructions of God. And I know that the priests belong to you. I am off limits concerning them as well as everybody else. But yet, this is an opportunity for my ambition to come into its place, for me to find my position and to walk into what I want to walk into by what? Killing all the priests. It's a demonic system because he came after the high priest first. Any and everything that is done to and by the high priest before Christ hit the earth was a reflection of what was to happen to him. Think about that. Any party that sat in that position actually walked in a grace And a mercy that was there because nothing could be done to the high priest that would actually attach to that that title or that position. Let me give you a for instance. How many people remember when Aaron and and, and, uh, Lord Jesus, Miriam, thank you, Dr. Hope. I'm like, why in the world I got a little fog right there? But (laughs) Aaron and Miriam talked against Moses. But only Miriam got struck with leprosy. Why? They were guilty of the same sin. What protected him? The priesthood. That high priest garment that he had on his body was a guard because he carried the same position that was the Lord's position. So sickness could not come upon the high priest because it could never touch Jesus. So when you understand that if you're in certain positions that you're not just there by yourself for yourself, you're there concerning the representation of what gave you that position in the first place. So here it is. The high priest is under an assassination attempt. And it was successful. We see the murderous intention in the heart of Doeg because he wanted favor with the king. He agreed with what was operating in in Saul's heart. And we know already what Saul was. We know that he was already in a place separated from the Lord. The Lord had already snatched his grace off of his life. He had already snatched his kingdom from him in the realm of the spirit and anointed another king in the natural. It just had not gone through the fullness of the coronation in order for it to be settled and solidified. But he was no longer king in the eyes of the Lord. In the kingdom of God, yes, I get it. He had a position in a place. And because of that position in a place, that's the only reason why David didn't touch him. Because he understood the spiritual law behind it. So he didn't touch him because he understood where he sat. And I will not sow that even to come upon my own life because I'm about to sit in that same seat. Thank you, Jesus. So as Doeg is sitting there, he became the merchant of death because light was not found in him. He agreed with what was in Saul's heart, that murderous thing, that that thing that was sitting there saying that I will defy every spiritual law for what I want. Because he wanted to try to preserve his kingdom by any means possible. But if you know that the Lord has already stripped you, you know your hand is not strong against God. You understand that he is undefeated with what he wants. That if he has a desire to tear down one and lift up another, it's already done by the way he wants to do it. So you can't fight against God trying to carry something out in your physical strength. But yet here he was trying to do this. We know that it's very clear that when people have no perspective of spiritual matters, they will do what is what right in their own eyes. This is why this is important for us now, because the Bible tells us that the last days will be like the days of Noah, where everybody did what was right in their own eyes. There will be no constraint on people. They will move against the laws of God, even against the laws of nature for what they want. And then tried to comp- compromise in a place where they tell you it's justified for me to want this thing. Not so. So I know that for many of us, the decree of death to a thing hits strong. But we got to understand how the Lord deals with things. 
as I stated, there are certain things that even as David prayed, he didn't pray according to his own mind. He prayed according to the burden of the Lord that was on him. And this is David's response in Psalm 52 about Doeg. We're going to begin at verse 1. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. You love evil more than good, lying rather than speaking righteousness. Selah. You love all devouring words. You, de your, you deceitful tongue. God shall likewise destroy you forever. He shall take you away and pluck you out of, the, the, out of your dwelling place and uproot you from the land of the living. That's why we can scream to the top of our lungs, death to Doeg. Doeg has to die and the system that he carries has to die. Why? People always talk about, yeah, when we talk about deliverance, we talk about the spirit of Jezebel, this, this, that, and the other. Jezebel had to die. Yeah. And the system that she carried, yes, it went on and it still is around today. But that system got to die too. Yeah, yeah. So in the same thought process, we have not paid attention as globally to Doeg yeah. as a carrier of abomination. As a carrier of a murderous intent to wipe out not only one line of the priesthood, he wanted to line, knock out both lines of the priesthood. What do you mean, Samuel Giles? Well, we know about Levi and his order that came, but David was under another priesthood. David began to function and operate. The backdrop to this whole thing was, was that David was running from Saul because Saul got a glimpse that David was going to take over. So he said, let me eliminate my competition however I need to. I'm going to take him out even though he's guilty of nothing. He served me faithfully, but I'm still going to treat him as if he's a traitor. I'm going to kill this man. I'm going to pin him to the wall. Whatever I can do to take him out, I'm going to do it. And anybody that gets in my way, even my own son, I'm going to be willing to take them out with him. But David said, no, nope, let me get out of here. He wept bitterly because he had a devotion to the house. He had a devotion to the kingdom. He had a devotion to Saul. And he wept bitterly having to run and to leave because he did not want to lift his hand against his leader. How many of you, though? Your leader come at you, you clap him back immediately. As a sign of what? Your immaturity because you don't realize that what? You are supposed to be submitted to God and in your submission to the Lord, even if your leader is acting off, you can still honor them in the midst of their offness because you understand that God put his hand on that leader. I'm not sanctioning abuse at all. Trust me. I have a standard that I uphold even as a leader myself. But yet and still, I've been in the pressure cooker. I'm talking from experience. I still had to stand and honor somebody who had, their, had my name in their mouths and they were trashing me and doing all kind of other things. But I walked in my integrity because it wasn't for me to get back at them. I had to walk in the integrity of the Lord to ensure that he will still have my back. And I got receipts if anybody need them. Amen. I'm not speaking crazy. But understand, David lost his home. He lost his wife. He lost his position. He lost uh, safety. He lost resources. He was in the king's palace. This man had to go and sleep in the woods, in the wilderness, on rocks, on all, all kind of stuff. All because somebody was jealous of what he carried. I want y'all to hear that. It wasn't about who he was, but it was about what he carried. Why? Because it was not what he, who he was that separated him from Saul. That wasn't it. Jesse's house had no other significance above Saul's house. Not at all. It wasn't about who he was, but what he carried made the difference. When Samuel went to anoint Jesse's sons, he was looking and saying, man, y'all look like kings. Let me go ahead and pour this oil but God's like, no, mm -mm, you're looking at the outer appearance. I look at the heart. I found one that looks like me. 
I want y'all to hold on to that. Anytime God sees himself inside of a believer, promotion and exaltation is on the way. Why? Because he needs to put the example before the people so that there can be replication of the right thing. So that you're not moving in stuff that's contrary. So that others who are receiving from your life are receiving of a good example and they're able to press into what God has for them to receive. But as David was living in this duality, spiritually and naturally, anointed to be king, fleeing from this man, he understood his priestly mandate. He understood the truth of the revelation of being able to walk in what he got a glimpse of. See, when he went to receive bread, Ahimelech said, we don't have any common bread. All we have is the bread that came from the table of showbread yesterday, and that was anointed unto the Lord, consecrated unto the Lord. It's not for regular men to eat. But here it is, Ahimelech got the revelation as a carrier of it. Because why would he put that ephod over the weapon of war that, that David took the head of Goliath with? It was a prophetic demonstration. And through it, he realized, I'm looking at one that's like me. He saw the grace of the high priest inside of David and was like, oh, all right, are your men consecrated? Have they been with women? It's like, no, we've been out for three days. No women has been in our midst. You know, we, it's common bread now. We can eat it. And Ahimelech was like, all right, cool. Go ahead and eat the bread. So David's priestly duty caused him to walk in the fullness of what he was. But this is what I love. It was his submission, sanctification, and consecration before the Lord that sanctified his men. Because they weren't of the lineage of Melchizedek at all. And if we understand how the system of the priestly order operates, anybody that is not of the lineage of the priesthood couldn't touch anything that came into the house of God. You had to be born of a line. Amen. But I thank God that we get a glimpse of the grace that can be extended to us even by the Lord Jesus. That because he paid a price and because he who he is, he can extend to us the lineage of his life and put it on us and we're made like him. Here you see a type and a shadow of it that David's sanctification poured out upon his men and they were able to eat of the same bread that he was able to eat of all because he had a covenant with the Lord. It's the power of you walking with Jesus that allows you to move in spaces where even your company can be blessed by the hand of the Lord. Hallelujah. I love it. Because when you start to see grace extend, you realize that Samuel walked in a power that Israel as a country had peace round about him as long as his eyes were open, as long as there was breath in his lungs, as long as his blood was running. There was no warfare against the entire country. How many want to walk in a grace that when you walk in the room, everything around you has to come into order, that when your house is, is in the midst of a tornado it may go and hit your entire neighborhood but it goes around your house and it moves and hit the houses and other places all because what there is an established grace it's the order of God I love it that David asked for the sword <laughs> because he realized it this was the the thing that gave me the victory and David was in a low place don't miss that this man, when he and Jonathan last connected, he was weeping, grievous that he had to run. Weak in his heart concerning the fact that he's being attacked and pursued. And at his lowest place, we see God reminding him of his greatest victory to date. And saying, even by the demonstration, that you didn't get this victory by yourself. You got it in the realm of the spirit. Let me show you that this thing is behind the ephod. Helping you to understand it's because you walked in your priestly uh, uh, encounter with me that allowed you to pick up this sword and wage a good warfare. So this is the thing that blessed me even to that degree. In his lowest point, he said, by whisper, who is Saul? Am I not the God who delivered you from the lion and the bear? And I'm not he that gave you the head of Goliath and made you a champion of Israel and of, of the Philistines? 
Did I not give you the foreskin of a hundred Philistines that you went out and fought by yourself and killed a hundred men of war all at the request of Saul? David was in his lowest place and God was saying to him, I am still your God. Hallelujah. I am still the one that taught your hands to make war and your fingers to fight. I am still the one that's the banner over you that is Jehovah Nisi. I am still the one that backs you. I am still the one that is behind the covenant that we have with each other. I am still the one that's going to make sure that you sit on the throne because I have legacy that's supposed to come through your life. God, I love you. So many times we get in the midst of transitional places and we get in frustrating places and we lose sight of our history with God. But it's our history that continues to speak in the realm of the spirit about who we are to remind us of our identity even when everything else is speaking contrary. Tears may be running down your face and the Lord begins to whisper, remember I'm with you. And if you understand that whole concept of that two or, or that little phrase, I'm with you. You could be in the worst situation and Joshua sw- springs up in your mind. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed for the Lord thy God is with you whithersoever you go. Be strong and very courageous. All of a sudden you feel the might of God beginning to stir on the inside of you as it is your portion. Hallelujah. I love it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because even in the fact that David didn't take the offense of knowing that he didn't ask for the position, he didn't ask to be king, he was just encountering the Lord. He was just handling his business, worshiping and tending the sheep, and was called out of his assignment into something that is greater. I'm saying this to each and every one of you in here because the Lord is speaking to you to call you out of your assignment into something greater. That as he's building Hunger Church higher, he's calling you out of your current assignment at the level that you are. And there is a a sound from heaven saying to you, come up higher. That I can show you things that you know not of. The spirit of inquiry is beginning to stir upon the people of this house that you begin to ask God the right questions. So many of us are absent of information because we choose not to ask the right questions. You're asking other things. You're asking for things that are either of this world or that are trivial to a measure of God's agenda. And he'd rather not answer you about what's trivial so that you don't put your focus on that. It's to get you to shift. Many of you have been wondering why he has not been answering about this thing that you've been asking over and over and over and over again. And he's trying to get you to understand it's time to shift and pivot your perspective to another place that he wants you to get something from him because there is an assignment yet waiting for you to show up. Now, why is it important for you to understand that when it comes to building within the house of God? It's not, so many times we caught up in, in, in just the, the politics of church and all the other things. But when you understand if you are on assignment to a house, he's bringing you on assignment with some things in you that's going to add to the house. But also he's coming, bringing you into this place so you can come with some bags to receive some stuff as well. And then as you add to the house, as the joint that you are that's supposed to supply to this house, you actually come into connectivity with other people that are born of the same eternal grace, that have things that you don't have, that can speak life to what you need for 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. This is training ground for you for the places that God has uh, called you for even in, in the end of things. But if you see it as me coming to church just to do church, you miss the significance of what God wants to do. I heard Dr. Hart say something to me one time. And he said this, and as soon as he said it, my heart just went right into the place that it was supposed to. He said, I want to build God an altar. That's all I needed to hear. I'm not trying to build a church. I want to build God an altar. Shows you the heart of the leader. That he wants to create a place where there is habitation, that there is a place of transformation. There is a place for you to engage with God and encounter the God of the Bible and be transformed forever. 
So this is not hunger church as, oh, I'm going to build this church. The people are going to come. We're going to do this. We're going to get this building. We're going to do this, that, the other. No. The building is a gathering place that the presence of the Lord will abide in. And if the presence of the Lord can abide in a place, guess what happens? The grace extends beyond the four, four walls of the house. All of a sudden, cities are transformed. Regions are transformed. The nations of the earth begin to be transformed. Why? Because people fly in to come to receive what they need to receive. I'm telling you what the Lord is building here. Something beyond what you've already stepped into in the thought processes of where you are. I know we come in, we jump, we dance, we shout, and it's amazing. But beyond that, I want to see transformation. I want to see experiences where people come and they pull into the parking lot and cancer falls off of their body. I, I, I want to see when they come, oh God, thank you Jesus. Whoo. It's a reality. But too many times we've been playing issues and games in churches and we lose the might of what God wants to demonstrate. The immense power of God has the ability to transform lives in ways that we've never seen. And that's what he's trying to introduce us into. Thank you, Jesus. I had to pull out of there, Lord Jesus. Ooh, God. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Understand, David was ushering in a point and a place of transformation that was happening to the priesthood because he was not of the house of Aaron and the house of Levi. There was a transitional point, and this is often what we miss. At every point of transition in your life, the Lord creates an opportunity. I, I want you all to hear this. Hear this well, because too many times... We get frustrated with transitional points because sometimes those transitions are easy. But if we hold fast to this one principle, that every transitional moment in our lives is a place that God wants to reveal himself afresh and anew. With a perspective that you've never seen before. Hear this. Isaiah was prophesying before he had the encounter with the Lord. And prophesying accurately. He was already recognized as a prophet. Moving in the grace of God. Doing what he was needed to do. But at the point of transition when King Uzziah died. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. And everything about his life changed because he had the ability to see. How much stewardship are you doing about your eyes even in the realm of the spirit? I get it in the natural, but how do you see in the realm of the spirit? Are you actually seeing openings and spaces, paying attention in the realm of the spirit where there's opportunities for you to engage with God for what he wants to do next? Or are you too committed to what was? Are you focused too much on what's happening now as opposed to having a prophetic foresight to look into the future and say, God, there's more. Yeah, God, I know we've gone here, we've gone there, we've ministered here, ministered there, we've done this, we've done that, but Lord, there's more. And so because I know that there's more, I will pray, I will weep, I will cry, I will fast until I break into the more because I want to see you in a way that I've never seen you before. We have to understand that folks, and, and this is, of course, demonically driven, we're not calling people demons, but we know that any time that there is a fight against what's next and the next is born of heaven, there's a demonic assignment. There is a warfare that happens right at the gate of that transition. There was silence in Israel for 400 years before John the Baptist hit the scene as the precursor. I love it. I will do no thing in the earth unless I reveal it first to my servants, the prophet. Here, here he comes, heralding, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And immediately what happened? Murderous intent arose out of the heart of Herod because he heard a king was on the way. This same spirit from Doeg begin to operate in the earth in multiple ways to kill this high priest that was going to be born and established to change everything forever. But at the same time, guess what? God wanted to reveal himself. 
So who had eyes to see and ears to hear? Mary had eyes to see and ears to hear. Elizabeth had eyes to see and ears to hear. Simeon had eyes to see and ears to hear. We, we see the different ones that begin to pray and, and fast, committing their entire lives. Anna crying and praying and pursuing to make sure that Christ hit the earth, even to the point of doing warfare against every demonic assignment that came to snatch him before he actually came into the fullness of what he's supposed to be. Because they had eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand and obey. This spirit operates to try to rob the church of what the church needs. Because this is what I love. Every time there is an opening for the Lord to do something different, you don't gain access to it by your own mind. The Bible says, who can know the mind of the Lord except the spirit of God? Who can know his ways but his spirit? We need engagement with the spirit of God to be able to step into a point and being able to understand what he's doing next. Too many times we allow logic to give us a perspective of what we're looking at. And it can look like chaos and disruption in the natural. But if we peer with the eyes of the spirit, oh God, you're behind this. If you're behind it, I can rock with it. It might be a little tight for a season, but guess what? I'll jump right in this thing with you and I'll hold on tight so that I can ride this wave into the next dispensation of what's about to be poured out in the earth. The Bible says it this way. Jesus stands at the door and knock, Revelation 3.20. And he says, to anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, you can't just hear and not take action, but it requires both the hearing and the action behind it that you open the door. He says, I will come in and I will dine with him and he with me. It's a point of intimacy, but we don't understand most of the time from a Hebraic standpoint, the table was a place of covenant. It was a place of agreement and alignment. You weren't invited to people's tables haphazardly. You were invited because you were of a same mentality, mindset, and belief system. It was unlawful for Jews to eat with Gentiles. Why? Because they were not aligned with the same uh, concept and, and, and thought process of God. They were not in agreement there. So there had to be a shift even in how they approached what they were doing. Why? Because God wanted to covenant with them. I'm going to say it this way. The Lord wants to invade our lives daily. But we have to work in a way that we allow him to have access so that he can invade every aspect of our lives. If I poll the room right now, many of you can identify areas where you say, Lord, I got everything else good to go. You can work in that. But this right here, I don't want you to touch. Be honest with yourself. You might not have said those exact words, but the way that you don't say it is you don't ask God about that area. You just move in what you believe you're supposed to do with it as opposed to inquiring of the Lord. Victories are won when you, when you inquire of the Lord. But when you try to do it on your own strength and in your own strategy, there is a point where you may step into failure all because you're common with it. And when God is trying to do an uncommon thing, he will shift you out of your normal pattern and put you into a place where you got to follow after him in a brand new way. Why? Because it strips you of your independence. Too many of us in the body, we want to be independent, but God wants you wholeheartedly dependent upon him no matter where you are. I don't care what you think you've grown into. I don't care what they call you. You're going to be apostle of the apostles, but you better sit your butt down under the authority of God and seek him daily. I know maturation is a place and there are some things that it should be. A, uh, you will do it out of the culture that you create to follow the principles of God. When you are a person of culture and principle, what you do is you begin to move in this thing ha habitually. It uh, becomes a, a second nature to you that in your actions of waking up at a certain time and seeking the Lord, it's something that you don't have to ask, Lord, do I need to get up at tomorrow morning and seek you at this time? No, it's become a part of the culture of your engagement with God. So you don't have to do that. Why? Because you are establishing a pattern that he can follow and he walks with you with that pattern and meets with you how he needs to meet with you. However, when it comes to anything beyond those, those things, you need to inquire. 
Story about the Gibeonites, for folks that don't understand how dangerous this can be that last generations. Joshua won battles by inquiring of the, of the Lord. The one time he didn't, he didn't inquire about the Gibeonites. He made a covenant that lasted the generations. Saul shows up, makes war against the Gibeonites. Guess what happened? Famine hit the land. David's like, yo, what's going on? What happened? Why is there famine? Lord, I ain't done nothing wrong against you. What's this deal? It's Saul. It's the covenant with the Gibeonites that's been violated. I want y'all to hear this. This spirit that comes through Doeg violates spiritual law. It causes you to be ignorant of it first. And then secondly, it's a lawless spirit. It begins to function in this way that you become lawless and insensitive to the things of the spirit. That where you would have originally had a check, that you would not move in that direction, that check lifts. Now you do what you feel. As opposed to what the Lord puts as a parameter and a boundary around your life. Trying to get you to understand this. Why? Because we are needed to create atmospheres that are conducive for the openings that God wants to do. If we do that, we have our lives surrounded by worship. Our lives surrounded by intimacy. Our, our lives surrounded by prayer. Our lives surrounded by points of, of fasting and dedication. You will ask the Lord how he feels about your attitude. You will ask the Lord how he feels about your thought process. He will ask the Lord how he feels about your conversations. You will ask the Lord if He how he feels about what you put in your mouth, what you eat. You will begin to inquire, God, how are you pleased with me? And you will allow the tutelage of Holy Spirit to begin to shift your appetite for where the Lord is calling you into. We are constantly in a place from going from glory to glory and we cannot move in the same thing in the same habit and get to the same place that God wants us to get to. There is a shift even in how he addresses his discipleship to you. Many of us, we say, oh, I went through my discipleship process. I got saved. I did 12 months or, or 12 weeks of discipleship and I moved on. To no, you are being discipled by the spirit of the living God. He is teaching you how to walk with him. And when you move outside of your discipleship, you start taking on another nature. It's so important because Peter was right there in the face of Jesus. Said, so let's call down a legion of angels to destroy these folks. And the Lord looked at him and said, you know not the spirit that you're operating in. That's not of me. Even though heaven and all the angels answer to me, that is not of me. You don't even realize my purpose for being in the earth. I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save it. I'm not in my judgment mode right now. I'm not sitting on the white horse with the sword on my thigh. I'm not in that space at this moment. And I need you to understand, here's the one though. That received the revelation, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. If you want to study a way for a person to jack up their ear, study the life of Peter. You see him fading in and out of spaces using his logic. He heard the revelation from the father's mouth. Don't miss that point. Jesus said, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but you've been, it's been revealed to you by my father who is in heaven. None of the other disciples had the ability to pull into that. They had the opportunity, but their ear wasn't attuned. And because their ear wasn't attuned, they missed opportunity. You had James and John that was invited to the Mount of Transfiguration with an opportunity. But guess what? Peter was the one who had the ear to hear. So my question to us, even in this moment, what are we doing to train our ear to be postured to hear what's next? I get it. We've been a part of church builds. We've been a part of this and we've been a part of that. But God is not doing things the same way. Because the dimension of what he needs to usher into the earth. Why? Because the days are evil. And he has to bring solutions through sons. And I'm not talking about being a son to a pastor or a son to a leader. No, you are a son to God. If you are led by the spirit of God, you are a son of God. He's calling us into sonship that we may mature and grow and put away childish things and arise to the level of responsibility that he wants us to have in the earth. Why is this important? Because God staffs every generation. 
what, what's necessary for the expression of God to be revealed to that generation. I know. You're like, man, what are you talking about? Psalm 14, 2. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand and who what? Seek God. He's looking for anybody who will turn their attention in his direction. I know y'all like, okay, it can't be that simple. What did Moses do? He saw a burning bush, turned his attention in that direction. And as soon as he turned the t his attention in that direction, the voice of the Lord opened up. And he heard the father speaking to him. And then he had to what? Do what was necessary to position himself to receive. Amen. So my question to you, are you trying to be a carrier of revelation? Because the opposite side of it is that Doeg is trying to get you by the spirit of the enemy to be a carrier of abomination. There's no in between. You will either be a carrier of revelation or a carrier of abomination. The carrier of revelation will usher in things that need to happen in the earth, will be a steward in a fellowship before the Lord God. They will walk in intimacy with the Lord. They will see the things come to pass that need to come to pass and they will bring transformation to the earth. Carriers of abomination will fight against the Lord's agenda and present something that is contrary. Mixture. What does mixture look like? I come to church. I say I'm saved. I move in the things of God, but I've been in the same level spiritually for the last five years. I have not grown. I have not increased. There is no greater weight on my life. When I speak, things don't shift. Why am I here? And the Lord will begin to speak to you about what you need to do to shift into that next place. All right? I'm going to hasten through some of these next points because we need to cover these things. But 2 Peter 1, 1 through 4. <clears throat> Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith, with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. Not in anything else. You need to know him for this grace and peace to come upon you and to multiply. And Jesus and of Jesus our Lord as his divine power has been given to us uh, <clears throat> all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which we have been given to exceedingly great promises great and precious promises sorry that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped corruption that is in the world through lust I know many of y'all y'all hear that word lust and you think something sexual but there are people that's lusting for power, that's lusting for fame, that's lusting for influence, that's lusting for money, that's lusting even for uh, notoriety or even lusting to be a part of a certain group. There is levels of lust that are poured out. And as those levels of lust are poured out, it's showing an unbridled nature that needs to be corrected. You cannot... Move out of an unbridled nature without what? Killing it. Peter said, I beat this flesh into submission. You don't, you know, you, you, you don't tickle it. You don't coddle it. You beat this flesh into submission. Ask yourself in this moment, what area of my life do I not have control over? Why? Because the scripture said you shouldn't be mastered by anything. So what is in your life that you do not have control over? What gets the best of you? What can't you fight? What is a habit that you have struggles in breaking? Because that's a challenge. And guess what I'm telling you? You can look at it and be like, oh, it's just coffee. No, it's a spirit behind it that's keeping you in a place that you cannot discipline yourself. And it's limiting I don't think y'all understand how powerful your taste buds are. But the scriptures tell us that Jesus ate curds and honey that he can discern between what was good and evil. It was a training. 
My diet was limited in a moment so that I could be created into a space that I could discern what was good and what was evil. And it was based on a natural thing. It was me eating, but there was only two things that I could eat, something savory and something sweet so that inside of my spirit, I could understand what was good and what was not. What is the Lord trying to use to train you that you don't want to let him use because it's not the tool of your choice? Hallelujah. Let him do what he needs to do. Because the other person that's on the other side of this development, you have never known before. And he's trying to introduce you to a level of grace and glory that you will step into and there will be an arising of a brand new man or woman. We need the knowledge of God. Because even as transition happens, we need to be able to discern what kind of transition is taking place and what we are to add to that transition so that the nature of God can be present. Because guess what? The power of moving in revelation and wisdom was never to be absent from the presence of God. Because outside of the presence of God, it could be corrupted. But inside of the presence of God, it stays aligned in the grace that it needs to stay aligned with. And guess what? Nothing can destroy it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm, I'm going to hasten through a couple of points real quick. First Corinthians, write down first Corinthians four, one through two. Because I know many of us think that we're not called and I, I, I've used the scripture before, probably the last time I was here, but I keep reiterating it for a reason. We are to steward the mysteries of God. But faithfulness is walking in a space where you steward those mysteries. Why? Because you understand that it is supposed to be something that you are given it, it, it's it's beyond just the ability to tap in no it's a gift of the father to sons to steward the mysteries of God Jesus was telling a parable and the disciples asked him why do you teach in parables and he said because they're not supposed to hear what you hear he was trying to train their ears and he said that it, it, it is my father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom in another verse. But in that particular verse, he was talking about it is uh, right for you to receive the kingdom. To know what I'm talking about without any kind of ambiguity. It doesn't, I'm, I'm decoding it for you is essentially what the Lord was saying. Because you need to hear it plainly from me. Because as it is locked inside of you, it is the grace of revelation that you're supposed to carry. The thing about, man, the thing about carrying grace and carrying revelation is that you don't carry it just to walk around with it. It's supposed to produce something. And everything that it produces does what? Gives God glory. You're not, <laughs> you're not sitting here wrestling with these spiritual beings about uh, uh, your back or, or whatever else that's going on in your body that he fights you with. No, you are trying to make sure that God gets the glory out of everything that he has created and established. Think about it. We don't have warfare really against creation in that sense. Yes, creation is groaning for the sons of God to appear. But how much do we see the oceans still operate, the trees still wave in the wind, we see flowers and trees still blossoming and blooming, we see the stars in the sky, we see the sun in the sky, and the scripture says this, the heavens are telling of God and his glory. But there's not necessarily warfare there. Where is the warfare coming that there will not be glory outside of? You. The enemy fights to make sure that you don't bring God glory. And this is the point. Because you are the actual uh, part of his affection that is greatest. This world, yeah, it, it is what it is, but he created another one. There's only one you that will walk in the earth. So when he designed you and put his imprint on you and marked you from birth and when he spoke to who you were and wrote in his book who you are, it was so that you would present the level of glory that you're supposed to present. I know each one of us are sitting here like, man, I, I hear all you saying, but when you think about the intentionality of God to create you 
and then to author something that has eternal weight and value to the point, and I'm going to give you a key. The Bible tells us that the words of God will not fall to the ground, that they shall what? Accomplish what he sent it to do and prosper the place that he has sent it. This is a tool for you. When you're in prayer, Father, I come into agreement with everything that you've written concerning my life. As Jesus said, I come in the fullness of the volume of the book written of me to do your will. Some of you are going to struggle there. But I promise you that as you let that rise up out of your belly over and over and over again, there is a commitment that now begins to shift and change everything about how you move and operate. Why? Because my heart is to do the will of the Father. This is the other part, though. Father, let your voice herald everything that you've written about my life. Because if you read it, it has to come to pass. If you speak it, you are not a man that you should lie, nor the son of man that you should repent. If you said it, you will do it. If you spoke it, you will bring it to pass. So, Father, herald everything that you have offered in the volume of the book concerning me. All of a sudden, you start seeing things that have been out of whack lining up. Because the sound of the Father's voice begins to usher in what needs to happen. Destiny helpers show up. You start seeing favor show up on your job. You start seeing money coming towards you. Contracts are pushed in front of your face. You're being called up by people you don't even know. Folks are referring you to people that you need for your business. You all of a sudden, there is a river that is flowing in your direction. Why? Because everything in the earth has to respond to the sound of his voice. These are keys so that you can walk in the revelation of who you are. All revelation is undergirded by truth. The Bible tells us that Jesus came to the earth full of grace and truth. So he is the one that speaks. The spirit of truth brings you into the knowledge of him. And as you move with the spirit of truth, truth begins to work in you. The Bible says uh, in David, he, he cried, or in Psalms, David cried out that uh, Psalm 51, I think it's verse 6, uh, behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden places, you, he will make you to know wisdom. Father, I thank you. You begin to pray into that. God, I thank you. Truth is in me. I thank you that it's in my inmost parts. Father, I come out of agreement with every level of deception and delusion. Father, I thank you that words that are unprofitable unto my life and unto my destiny. They have no weight. They have no power. I thank you, Lord God, that the highest law in operation is my, in my life is your law. It is your word. Father, I thank you that as I move in this grace, that you are ushering me into the places that I need to go. I thank you that truth is a guard unto me and a river of life. Begin to pray that way. Truth undergirds revelation and keeps you where you need to be. And that revelation begins to open and blossom. And then out of the immutability of God's counsel, there is a confirmed oath. Write down Hebrews 6, 17 through 20. Hallelujah. Revelation empowers us to receive both light and capacity. And it helps us to see in a brand new way. We can't, if we can't see it, we can't step into it. If we don't hear it, we don't have language for it. If we don't understand it, we will not pursue it. Think about the number of things, and your pastor spoke with you last week about your commitment. Think about the number of things that you did not have full understanding of, and because you didn't have full understanding of, you didn't even approach it. Even though the Lord told you to do it, your faith was a little tapped, and you didn't move into it because it looked too ambiguous. Okay, we're going to act like that ain't hit. I'm going to tell you for real. I know it's in the room. I haven't done it myself. But it's a place that God wants to challenge you. Can you move in the unknown and do what the father of faith did? Go to a place that I, I will tell you. I ain't telling you now. I'm going to tell you when you begin to move. Build something that you don't have a framework for. You don't know that I have people set up that will actually join hands with you and build it for you. But I need you to step out on the, on the water and begin to walk with me in this new space. Because what I'm trying to do is set you up so that you can provide for your family at a measure that you need to. Because there is a nation that I want to send you to. And if I send you to this nation prematurely, it's going to break you. But if I make sure that you have this cushion, I can establish you that you can travel how you need to and serve my people and open the nations of the earth to the gospel of the kingdom father expand capacity in the minds of your people 
Break us out of limit, limited thinking into limitless imagination to see what you want to do with us next. Yeah, I know we are known for certain things, but God, what are we known for in heaven that we don't know yet? Help us to step into that, to catch revelation of it. Hallelujah. Matthew 6, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body is what? Full of light. If you begin to move in light, the Bible tells us that the scriptures, it gives light and then gives understanding to the simple. If we have the ability for light to pierce through levels of darkness that, that come by way of confusion and come by way of ignorance, now there's understanding that comes that rests on our lives. And if light is shining upon us, it's because the light comes from and radiates the face of the father the bible says that he will turn his countenance in your direction and look the light begins to shine his mind begins to hit your mind all of a sudden there is a brand new level of creativity that flows towards you and you start operating in things that you have never touched before am i the only one that believes in witty inventions and creative ideas solutions come from sons yeah the, the world are producing levels of solutions but it's supposed to pale in comparison from the house of God we have the omniscient one on the inside of us but many of us have not asked him for the unlimited aspect of the genius of the mind of the Holy Ghost we start praying small help me to function on this job no, God, help me to build corporations. And I ain't got to build it from the ground up. Just give me the grace to acquire it. And then when I acquire it, give me the knowledge and the strategy to scale it. And then when you give me the knowledge and the strategy to scale it, help me to be postured so that I'll have it in the right place with the right setup and let me know the timing in which I'm to hold on to it because you might not tell me to keep it forever. It might not be what's supposed to be generationally unto my family. It might just be that I build it to a certain level and then sell it for nine figures. Because guess what? You could take the nine figures and live off 10 million and then sow 90 million to the kingdom and be comfortable but finance the agenda of God I don't know about you but there is a level of partnership that he's looking for and I'm saying Lord I am available open up my open up my mind to the level of genius that you desire to display in the earth show me things that will be problems 5, 10, 15 years in advance that we will be on the cusp as the body to step into a place that the world will have to come to us for what we have God. Father, I thank you for angels that will work with your people to bring this thing to pass. We got too many examples in the word. Daniel lived through five administrations. Joseph empowered outside in freedom, but also empowered in the prison. He prospered both places. Why are we sitting here with limitations on the level of prosperity that we're walking in? And I'm not preaching a crazy prosperity gospel. I'm talking about the knowledge of the king inside of you. I will withhold no good thing from them that walk uprightly. When you make a decision that you cannot be bought, he trusts you with everything. Because your devotion is in the right place. He's trying to raise carriers of revelation. And kill this spirit of Doeg. Christ has established his perpetual victory. An abomination comes to recruit men into levels of abomination so that they move away from the things of the Lord and they lose the fear of God and operate in folly and operate in wickedness and operate in lawlessness and begin to reproduce after their own kind why do you see so many people even that were, were, were birthed in the church literally get over into the world and get jacked up and then when they get jacked up they start reproducing themselves 
We see seasons and spaces where artists and individuals start speaking of certain things. Yeah, we know all of the foolishness that the enemy has set up to establish. But guys, God, God, guys guess what? The Lord desires to raise up such a demonstrative uh, demonstration of his kingdom inside of every sphere of influence. That it causes everything that was born of the enemy to look and say, you are God. Think about Nebuchadnezzar. Think about the number of nations that bowed to this man. And then think about when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego comes into this place. I taught a, a message uh, training with a group that I love dearly. But we were talking about prospering in our priesthood. And the Lord highlighted something to me. That his law of prospering and for it to be enduring was something that was born of his presence. That as long as it was under his sanctioning, enduring riches was a part of what he had established. I was like, okay, Lord. But he said, look at Babylon. I created Babylon as a punishment tool to address the wickedness that was in Israel. But I spoke by my own voice that Babylon would prosper. But because I'm committed to my law, there has to be the right alignment. If it's going to endure for 70 plus years, I have to make sure that there is an altar in the midst of the company of the people that can allow that enduring riches to remain that's sanctioned by heaven. So here comes Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the first significant thing that happens with them, they put their lives on the altar. He saw a worthy sacrifice in the midst of them to the point that the Lord himself had to show up in the fire. And say that if you're going to lay down your life like this, you're doing what I'm going to do in a time to come. So let me come and give you the favor of seeing my presence. Let me come and demonstrate to you just how much you're operating in who I am. And the consecration level of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as carriers of revelation ensured that the prosperity of Babylon was legal in the realm of the spirit. It wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar eventually said that your God is God, but later he raised himself up and the Lord had to humble him. And God, I love the way the Lord does things. His laws don't change. He said, I'm gonna put you into submission to the level of creation. I'm going to make you like a beast. And when you begin to act like a beast instead of acting like a man, that's the, the crescendo of your humility. Because you acted like a beast and you ate the grass and you grew in your body what made you look like a beast and you acted like creation around you that was giving God his glory. Now I can establish you and raise you back up. I know I said to y'all earlier, the heavens and creation is telling of God of his glory. This man came into alignment with what was an established order of God receiving the glory that was due to him. And at that point, God said, now I can turn you back into a man. And in that, he said again, God, you are God. But it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar's altar that created a space for the grace of God to be prospered. It was the priesthood of Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego that allowed there to be lasting and enduring riches in the midst of Babylon. What does God want to ensure? Is me. You thought you were sent to that company just to have a job. But there was a season that he wanted to prosper that company and he needed an altar to ensure that he can do it lawfully. And he sent you there on assignment. When you understand that you carry revelation at the level that you need to, it's, it's, it's not just for you to display your knowledge of God to people. It means that you have an understanding of spiritual law at a level that allows you to function in realms and dimensions that you may never get the credit for here on earth. But heaven speaks for you. And heaven prospers you. And you do the will of your father. I'm going to bring it to a close with these things. 
I could go further with Doeg's character and all of the things that he represented. But I'm going to say this to you. There is a measure of victory that God wants you to walk in, but victory doesn't look like what you thought. Victory looks like you being able to walk in this dimension of revelation. And then out of it, what he has written for your life and your destiny, everybody will testify and say, this is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Why does that need to be the testimony of your life? Because there are other gods that are competing for the glory. Mammon is competing for glory. Satan is competing for glory. Leviathan is competing for glory. But I don't know about you, but I read in my scriptures where it says all glory, all honor, all dominion, all might, all power belongs to who? This is your portion, people of God. It's the whole reason why I'm speaking like this. Because too many times we let what is our inheritance go by the wayside. And if we track the examples in the word, any person that lets their inheritance go by the wayside as if it's a trivial thing comes under the scrutiny of God in another measure. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Why? Because I gave up something that was eternal for something that was temporal. What are we trading on the trading block? Not thinking about what God wants to release inside of you. Not only to redeem your bloodline, but rescue others that don't have a kinsman redeemer in it. I'm telling you, it's the heart of the Father to rescue generations. If you align with him, he gives you the power and the grace, the capacity to handle the lives of others who didn't have fathers, who didn't have mothers, who did not have the resources to have an inheritance. What happens if you come and see families that have been locked in poverty for the last 10 generations? Say, so, woman of God, I know you just came out of the hospital. You had anxiety. You had stress. You might even have had a stroke. Your last ten, five generations, just say five, that you could think back to everybody in your family was in poverty. But I stand as a benefactor to you. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, my only request is that you put this sign up in your house. The Lord has done it. Nobody else. I don't want my name attached to it. The Lord has done it. And I'm standing as a benefactor to say to you and your bloodline for the next five generations, you are set for life. What happens? Ooh, what happens when you begin to move in that level of power and demonstration? What happens to families and bloodlines that you change them forever and then you put a spiritual mark on them because they know that it's not something that's done by the flesh, but it's done by the assignment of the Lord. How many people in here want to change entire generations? This is what revelation opens up for you. Dimensions in God. For all of us, the Lord wants to make us living epistles read of men. He writes on the tablet of our hearts his word, on his mind our words, his words. And he wrote a book for us. And he wants that book to be read of men by the way you live. So his words are not idle. The Bible says his words are what? Living, active, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing between joint and marrow, meaning that no genetic setup is to hold you back. Care what family you were born to. Yes, there may be altars and dedications and all of that that you need to take authority over. I get it. But at the end of the day, once you're born again, there is a new lineage that you are a part of. And there is a pronouncement over you that you are mine. And because the Lord says that you are mine, all of a sudden what belongs to him belongs to you. Changes everything about your life. Woo. Second Peter... 4, 17 through 18, it says in a nutshell that the Lord will give you grace to preach what he has revealed in you. 
the grace to preach it. I know many of you say I'm not a preacher. But what happens when you stand in the face of every single thing that has been done against you and you speak to that thing? Mm -mm. My life was created for this. I am a preacher of Jesus, but I reveal the Father. Why? Because I act just like Jesus. I preach him so that you know the way to salvation, but then I reveal the Father. That's what he's trying to lead us into. For his words are the full demonstration and expression of his person in our lives. He wants us to live from this place. I'm going to give you a, a few keys to destroying murderous systems of ambition and envy in your life. You have no reason to envy anybody. You have no reason to be jealous of anybody. I labor to say that you have not seen the pages of the volume of the book written of you. That's why you feel undervalued. But if you begin to ask the Lord, Lord, I need to see what's written whew, on the pages of the volume of the book written of me. <laughs> that I may do your will. So when I see the intricacies of what you've done to make me, I know what I'm called to. I know what I'm breathing air for. I know what my assignment is. And nobody can deter me from it because I'm ready to sacrifice whatever I need to in order to do it. Things that you have to give up don't even look like a sacrifice anymore. <laughs> it's pennies compared to the glory that's going to come from it. God, I thank you. I have to eat this because I, I feel the pull of the Lord into greater dimensions even as I'm preaching this word. And I know that there are some things that I have to release. And in releasing it, I know what it's going to do. But I give him grace, glory, and honor for where he's calling me into because I hear generations calling. I hear nations calling me. I'm telling you it's in the room. It's not just about me. I'm saying it so that you will have the understanding of what the Lord is opening up now. Your destiny is screaming from heaven. The pages of your book is screaming from heaven. Calling you into the revelation that you are supposed to walk in, in body and fulfill. These are the keys to destroy this murderous system of, of envy and ambition. One, you need the fear of the Lord. Secondly, you need to walk in humility. Thirdly, you need to embrace sonship and all that sonship means. You need to be in a place where you allow yourself to be tutored by the Spirit of God. A desire to be one with Him. The nature of sonship, meaning that you are inheritance focused. You have to focus on inheritance and realize nothing is worth your inheritance. Nothing. I don't care what she looks like, what he looks like, what he is offering, what she is offering. Nothing is worth your inheritance. And that's what the enemy is trying to get you to bargain with. The principles of, leader, of sonship, honor, submission, service. You need to be aware of the enemies that come to fight against your sonship. Fourthly, extreme honor. Honor is not flattery. Honor is not giving man glory. If anything, in the honor, you thank the Lord for who this person is. You thank the Lord for his creation in the earth. You thank the Lord that he would think enough of you to send this person in your life and in your direction. You move into that so that you what? Break idolatry. And Father, may every curse that has been released over people by leaders that wanted them to move into idolatry because of religious tradition. Father, I sever it now in the name of Jesus. I decree that their hearts are to worship you and you alone. 
that you are the preeminent one. You are the only one that our eyes are to focus on. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We thank you now that you are breaking these curses off of people. I decree in the name of Jesus, righteous judgment upon these curses now. Let the verdicts of God begin to free them from levels of captivity that they've been held hostage to. Father, the fear of walking into their positions that they're supposed to be aligned in their in the body of Christ all because they've been misused by demonic vessels that wanted them to idolize I decree by the grace of Jesus that there is freedom coming unto them in the name of liberate their hearts now I thank you for courage arising father I thank you for a brand new liberty that they will stand and be themselves unadulterated unapologetically father I thank you for authenticity coming upon them in brand new ways let them move in the power of God that you may display the revelation of your splendor the Bible says you made us a little lower than the angels and crowned us with glory and with honor let the splendor of your design being made in your image and your likeness arise in every son or daughter one thing about extreme honor is giving people what I described giving people what they could not attain on their own or by their own means that's extreme honor David said is there anybody from Saul from Jonathan's house that I can show favor to because of Jonathan's sake for each of you may kings begin to ask is there anyone that I can show favor to from your house from your name all because of your sake and how you moved in a grace because you walked out the revelation of God concerning you. You impacted them so tremendously that for generations to come, they release favor and blessings upon your bloodline and your lineage. This is what sonship looks like. Lastly, unity. The power of a unified vision. We are aligning to carry out God's plan in the earth. For Hunger Church Atlanta, you are aligning to carry out God's plan. Yes, it was released to visionaries like every vision is. However, it's the Lord's plan. Stay free from what's beneath you and what's trivial. If it's not born of eternity, leave it alone. Walk in higher measures. Walk in higher places of authority. Walk in higher places of responsibility. Let go of ungodly and unprosperous conversations. Let your words be few and measured. Because if you want your authority to increase, your words actually should be few. Why? Because you're realizing, Lord, I'm consecrating my tongue unto you. And even my fingers that I type with, I'm consecrating them unto you because I understand that your standpoint is you want me to speak as the oracles of the living God. I'm not speaking by my own accord, but I want my words to be measured so that when I speak, heaven responds. When I open my mouth, angels mobilize. When I begin to move according to the agenda of God, everything in the earth, atmosphere begins to shift because it has to bring to pass what I've spoken these are words that cause you to step into levels of authority to make you feared in the earth the demon said Paul I know Jesus I know but who are you my question where are you known where does your voice cause trembles to happen where does fear show up all because you opened your mouth under the direction of God Everything doesn't deserve your response. Because it's, if it's not going to usher in the kingdom, you don't need to say it. But if it's going to usher in God's agenda, let me open my mouth, cry aloud, and spare not. Because there's a shift.